purpose. Uh -oh. Let me turn my mic back on here. Let me this right. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Our purpose for existing is so that we might serve God. Yes. Can I say that again? Yes. Our purpose for existing is so that we might serve God. A life that is lived in the service of God is truly a satisfying life. All right? Life that is lived in the service of God is truly a satisfying life. Years ago, some uh, secular rock band came out with a song that said, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> and they said, I try, and I try, but I can't. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and, and, and they talked about how all the things that they tried, they just, they just couldn't get any satisfaction. But never in that song did they try Jesus. Never. Never. And, and, and I want you to know that whatever you do in life, whatever you determine your path is in life, unless that path is centered around Jesus, you're not going to be satisfied. And it doesn't matter how much money you make. You might think, well, Rev, if, if I could just get into that six-figure bracket, you know, that, that hundred thousand, I'd be doing good. Well, a lot of people are in that bracket, and they're just not satisfied. They're not. So we have to come to grips with the fact that God made us with a desire in our hearts to serve him. And, and, and unless you are serving God, you're not satisfied. And you're not going to be satisfied. And, and I want to say, serving God is more than just coming to church on Sunday. It, it, it's, it, it's more than just singing in the choir. It's more than just taking up the offering. It, it, it's so much more. Serving God is a lifetime, daily, 24-7 commitment. That's what serving God is all about. And, 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 and what a joy and a privilege it is to know that I get to walk and talk with my maker. I don't know what that does for you. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what that says to you, but it just thrills my heart so much as I look up at the sky, as I see the clouds, as I feel the sun, and uh, as I fly many times and, and up in that plane, 35, 40,000 feet in the air, and see all the wonders of God's creation. It, 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 it thrills my heart, and many times I will turn to the person sitting next to me who probably got things in their ear and don't want to be bothered. <laughs> but I will many times say to that person, I give them a little elbow, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, my God did all that. I'll, I'll, I'll say that to people. I'll say that to people. My God did all that. And on the last flight I had, I told you about it, when I was, I, I was leaving Florida, they told me the flight was canceled, and so instead of flying from Charlotte, from Florida to Charlotte, North Carolina, to Cincinnati, they flew me from Florida to Washington, D.C. It's all the nation's capital as we came in there. But on the flight from D.C. to Cincinnati, I sat next to a lady who was a student at Xavier. In fact, she was a volleyball player. A girl taller than me. Long, lanky thing. And um, we sat right next to each other. But on that flight that was about an hour and a half, it seemed like it was only 20 minutes. Because, it wasn't there? Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. 
Um, it, it, it was just, it was a very, it, was, it seemed like a very brief flight because on that flight, God gave me an opportunity to witness to that volleyball player. All right. Oh, that, uh, is that what I said, volleyball? Yeah. And, 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 and she was asking questions. She was asking questions, and I was doing my best to give her answers. Um, she was from a foreign country. Had not heard about many stories in the Bible. Didn't know much about the Lord at all. And I thought, wow, what a joy it is to serve God. Because you just never know who he's going to put in your path. What contact you're going to have with people so that you might be able to honor and represent him. Folks, that's what serving God is. Amen. That's what serving God is about. We get to walk and we get to talk with our maker. I'm telling you something. You can have this world. I'll take Jesus. Like the old songwriter said, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I, I, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world could afford today. I, you laying on your hospital bed and you sick and it don't look like you're going to get well, who are you going to want? You're not going to say, oh, savings account. <laughs> oh, credit card. You're not going to call on that. You're going to call on the Lord, I hope. You're going to be seeking God and wanting Him to touch you and, 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 and wanting Him to bless you. And so the disciples of Jesus, the first disciples that He called, they were willing to walk away from everything and serve Him. So the words that Moses spoke to Pharaoh are words that I believe are powerful for us even today as he tried to get the king of Egypt to realize that it was time to let the people go. And not only that he let them go, he gave them the reason why he should let them go. And there's that statement again, that they may serve me. What a statement God puts here right in his word. And, and, and that statement not only applied to the people way back then, it also applies to people today. It is God's desire that you and I serve him because... That's why we were created. We were created to serve God. We were created to honor and glorify Him with our lives. And in that service to God, it will require that we have an attitude that we're willing to give up anything and everything in order that we might serve Him. Amen. I said, to, I said before about those early disciples. Jesus called them one day when he was teaching near the Sea of Galilee and there were a couple of boats there that had just come in from the night fishing but they didn't catch nothing they didn't catch nothing now as I said before to them not catching anything is big you know when I go fishing if I don't catch nothing which is rare um, uh, if, 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 if I don't catch nothing, you know, that's really not a big deal. I'll, I'll stop at Grover or Meyer and get me some fish. Uh, uh, but I'd rather catch it. But if I don't, no problem. I'll eat McDonald's fish sandwich. I'll eat that if I want some fish. But for these guys, for these guys, this, this was their livelihood. This is how they survive. And if they don't get fish, they don't eat. 
So they had spent the night. Because many times, that's the best time to do the kind of fishing that they did, which was by a net. They would oftentimes throw a net out there and, and then draw the net in and whatever, whatever was in the net, you know, usually different kind of fish would be brought in in the net. And so these disciples were, were, were out of the boat and, and, and they were washing their net, the Bible says, and Jesus turned to one of the fishermen and got into his boat and said, would you pull your boat out just a little bit more to the sea because the crowd was just pressing in and he wanted to give them more room and he wanted to begin to teach them from the boat. And that's what Jesus did. After he finished teaching, he said to Peter, he said, okay, Peter, take your boat out a little further into the sea and let down your net so you can get some fish. Peter said, Lord, we done done this thing all night long. Ain't got nothing, but nevertheless, at your word, All right. because you tell me, I'm going to do it. And you're probably grumbling. <laughs> you don't make no sense. I've <laughs> been out here all night, ain't caught nothing. Amen. Because we're out there again. <laughs> so here we go. So they go out. Let the net down. And from out of nowhere, all kind of fish flipping and flopping and jumping and filling up the net, his boat began to sink. He had so many fish, and he called for James and John and said, hey, you guys get in the boat and get over here. I'm about to experience a net-breaking, boat-sinking blessing. Come on, come on, come on. All right. And, 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 and they got all of those fish, hundreds of them. And they brought them to shore. Not only are they going to eat, they're going to make some money. Right? Yes, All them fish, they're going to make some money. Yeah, guys. Woo! Give them these other high fives. Yeah, all right. Let's go. And then the Bible says they walked away from it. They left it all to follow Jesus. All right. What a change. Yes, sir. What a difference it makes when you follow the Lord. What, what, what peace and, and, and love and joy and hope and, and, and what great thrill it is to follow Jesus, y'all, and to serve him. And that's what these first disciples began to experience as they began to follow the Lord. They left everything to follow and serve him. And, and, and we can tell by their actions how truly serious they were about following Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves, how, how, how serious are we? How serious are we about following the Lord? You know, some of us ain't serious at all. Because we let somebody look at us funny. <laughs> Discourage us. I ain't going back to that church. How come? So they look at me funny. They looked at you funny. Well, maybe you look funny. I don't know. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I don't know. I don't know. But, 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 why, why is it we let the smallest, littlest things Get, up, get in us, get under our skin, and mess us up, and, and we don't want to do what God has told us to do. How tragic and how sad is that? Here these first disciples had so much going on at this time, all this fish, all this money, and they said, you know what? We're leaving it. Because Jesus said, come on, guys. I want you to follow me. Maybe they finally recognized that the one who created the fish was inviting them to follow him. <coughs> and if he's going to bless them that way, surely there's so much more that he would do in and for their lives. I'll say it. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Serving God 
There's no better way to live and no better way to die Amen. than to be in God's service. Hmm. Yes, now, we look at this seventh chapter of Exodus. We see here how Moses has been trying to get Pharaoh's attention. And I wonder sometimes, what does God have to do to get our attention? What does he got to do? Lose your job? Wreck your car? Some other thing has to happen? Now, I'm not saying all of those things happen because God's trying to get your attention. Not necessarily, no. But sometimes they do. Sometimes the very thing that we put so much trust and so much hope in, God said, I'm going to take that from you. All right. Because you got your trust and your hope in the wrong place. Don't put your hope in things. Don't put your hope in stuff. Because that stuff ain't going to last. It'll be gone in an instant and in a moment. And so Moses, Aaron were trying to get Pharaoh's attention. But he wasn't having it. And since the words Moses spoke didn't get his attention, maybe the wonders that Moses would do would get his attention. The words didn't work. Maybe the wonders will. So the first wonder was when God told Moses and Aaron to lay the rod down in front of Pharaoh. And the rod became a snake. Well, Pharaoh called in his magicians and, and his other uh, uh, enchanters, and they had some rods with them. They threw their rods down. I don't know how many, but it was, the Bible tells us they had rods, so it's more than one. They threw their rods down, and guess what happened? Their rods became snakes. And they thought, what you going to do about that? Not to work. Moses' snake swallowed their snake. And became a rod again in his hand. And so God said to Moses, now, the words didn't work. That was a wonder. Here's the next wonder. Stretch out your rod over the river there, the Nile River, because that was the place where Pharaoh would come just about every morning, I guess to take a swim or something, but he would come down to the Nile River every morning, and, and he was there in the river at that time where Moses and Aaron confronted him and said, God said, let my people go. And there's that statement again right at the end. That they may serve me. Say that with me, y'all. That they may serve me. That's what God said. Let them go so that they may serve me. And because you didn't let them go, God said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn this river into blood. So God said, stretch a rod out there. The rod was stretched out, and all of a sudden, that Nile River became a river of blood. Can you imagine driving across the suspension bridge, looking out on the Ohio River, and it just suddenly turned red and turned to blood? Can you imagine that? Well, imagine that in your mind because that is exactly what happened here in Egypt as, as God was once again trying to get Pharaoh's attention and that river that was so vital and so important to the life of Egypt, of, of, of the industry and everything that went on there in Egypt, that river was crucial. And yet God says, it's going to become blood. And it did become blood. And the Bible tells us that the water that was there became blood everywhere. In other words, 
There were streams. They became blood. There were pools where people might have swam in. Individual pools, they became blood. There were ponds. Those ponds became blood. Can you imagine if you were a woman washing your hair? And all of a sudden, you pour the water over you, and blood just came out over you. Can you imagine that? Or can you imagine you were just taking a bath, and all of a sudden, you were bathing in blood? Everything there that had water turned to blood. Or you were sitting there drinking your coffee and reading the Egyptian Enquirer, and you picked up your coffee blood. Oh, that's net. Blood coming out of you, coming out. Everywhere there was water, there was blood. Look with me, if you would. Look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. Let you, let you see that I'm telling you the truth here. Verse 19, same chapter, chapter 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say unto Pharaoh, Take your rod, I say unto Aaron, say unto Aaron, take your rod, stretch out your hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon what? Upon what else? What else? What else? That they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Both in vessels of wood. That's when they would draw uh, water from the well. And they would keep water in vessels. In, 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 in the wooden buckets that they would use to draw water from the well. And both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. That's how they stored their water. They kept their water. Everything. God said. Is going to be turned to blood. And that's exactly what happened. God commanded Pharaoh to let the people go, and he wouldn't let the people go. How many know if you don't obey God, you're going to have to deal with some consequences? You are. You don't follow the way God wants you to follow. You don't go the way God wants you to go. You better be sure you're going to have some consequences to deal with. Pharaoh had him. And here's the thing. Because of his stubbornness, now watch this, how this works. Because of his unwillingness to follow God, he caused other people to suffer. Yes. Right? Yes. All the people in the land, of, all the Egyptians there had suffered because one man, one person refused to follow God. You see, folks, it don't take a lot of people to mess things up. Amen. Does it? One person Amen. can mess up a lot for a lot of people. That's why it's vital that we follow God, that we serve God, and that we serve Him with all of our hearts. You see, I, it, it, part of Pharaoh's problem, too, was I think Pharaoh was so hung up on himself, he thought Moses' command was a request. I think he thought it was a request. And he, he kind of had the mindset like Moses was saying, uh, uh, Pharaoh, um, if, 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 if you don't mind, um, would, would you please let the people go when you get ready? Please, sir. No! That wasn't the way he put it at all. It wasn't a request. It was a command. And God said, let him go. That they may serve me. That's what God was interested in. Pharaoh thought the Hebrews were his people. But God let Pharaoh know, no, these are not your people. These are not your property. And so God set the record straight by calling them his people. 
And the Bible says, we are what? His people. And the sheep of his pasture. Folks, I'm so glad I belong to him. I was lost and he found me. I'm so glad I belong to him. Now, because Pharaoh wouldn't listen to the words, maybe he would change his mind when he saw the wonders. But he didn't. He didn't. God knew all about Pharaoh's daily routine. He knew what he was going to do and when he was going to do it. And of course, we said before, he went down there by the river. And that's when God confronted him. Once again, let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen. God made it clear that he wanted his people free so that they might serve him. Let me ask you a question. Who are you serving? Some of us are serving ourselves. That's a bad person to serve. Bad person to serve if you find yourself serving yourself. And to be quite honest with you, when you serve yourself and you serve your own fleshly desires, actually, you're really serving the devil. That's what you're doing. If you are not serving God, you only have one other alternative. Because listen, you're going to serve somebody. You're going to serve somebody. Why not? Why not serve the one who loves you and died for you? Why not serve him? Because listen, Satan don't love you. In fact, he hates you. He really does. Satan hates you, and there you are doing his bidding. But he hates you. Why not serve God? He loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He cares so much about you. Satan could care less about you because he's got a whole lot more like you. And when he's through with you, which he won't be through until you die. Then what have you accomplished? What have you done? Let my people go that they may serve me. So all of us one day are going to stand before God. All of us. We're going to stand before God. And guess what? We're going to have to give an account for our service. God. We're going to have to give an account for our service for God. And I'm going to tell you something. Excuses will not be accepted. Amen? Amen? Amen. And church service is too long, Lord. That preacher long-winded, Lord. But that preacher wasn't right. He had this affair and that affair. And I, ain't, I ain't trying to do church, man. I ain't trying to do that. Mm-hmm. So you're going to miss out on eternity with God because of what somebody else does or didn't do. How foolish is that? You're going to spend eternity with those same people. So if I was you, I would make up in my mind that for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And we're going to serve him with our whole hearts. Yes, sir. With all we got. We're going to serve him. Yes, sir. And, 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 and listen, we ain't going to allow no one or nothing to get in our way. All right, sir. Amen? Amen? I'm going to serve God. Amen. The old times used to say, for God I live. For God I die. And for God I die. And, 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 and that's the kind of attitude that, that, that we have to have today.
ultimately, ultimately, Satan wants to drag you down to hell mm -hmm. with him. That's what he wants. But you don't have to let him do that. So what do I got to do, Pastor? It's simply this. Humble yourself. See, that was Pharaoh's problem. He thought he was the mighty king of Egypt and the Egyptians really viewed him as a god. He was viewed as a god. And they thought he was just this great supernatural being when he was just a little pitiful, measly man. That's all he was. He wasn't nothing. And God had to let him know who was really in charge. And, and all the different gods that they had there in Egypt, they weren't nothing. They couldn't do nothing. Made of stone and made of idols. Men made those! And all of these images that they had there in Egypt. And it didn't do them any good at all. Pharaoh didn't want to humble himself. And it cost him, and it cost those in his kingdom dearly. <clears throat> so humble yourself before your Lord and King. Give him your heart. Offer your everything. A long time ago, I made that commitment to God. Even before I went into the ministry, as a young person, about 10 or 11 years old, I made that commitment to God. God, I'm going to live for you. And I really didn't know what, 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 you know, I didn't know a lot what that meant at that time. I didn't really know. But as I kept coming to church, as I kept listening to the Word of God, as I began to get into the Word of God myself, as I began to put this word into my heart and into my mind, as I begin to understand a little more clearly what it really does mean about serving God. And then I begin to grow in that knowledge and in that wisdom. And guess what, y'all? I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I'm still serving. And, and, and that's a choice I made. That's a choice you have to make. You've got to make that choice. God said to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. God is looking for people who are willing to serve him. Amen. Not people who are going to make excuses. Not people who are going to slip and slide and shove and jive. Hit and miss. He ain't, no, no. He's looking for people who are willing to say, Lord, I give everything to you. I humble myself before you. I give you my heart. I offer my everything. Because listen, there's no limit on the love God has for you. But all you got to do is humble yourself and see what God can do. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise today, God. Give him some praise right now. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. He's a wonderful God. He's a gracious God. And he loves him some people. He really does. He does. He really does. There used to be a, a course. We don't really sing it much here, but years ago, uh, when I was with the Baptist group there in Cincinnati, we, we, we used to sing this little, little portion that says, Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life one more. Could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. And, 
and that's why I serve. I serve him because he loves me. And, and I serve him because what's the alternative? Right. We'll serve the devil? Right. Be with Satan forever? Right. Who wants that? Right. Who wants that? Right. Live for Jesus. Amen. Serve God Amen. with all your heart. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Listen to the song here. We have our time of invitation.